Hello everybody, it's me again, this is Andy, with UFOs and other paranormal stuff. How are you all doing? I'd like to thank you all for listening to all my episodes, but especially the most recent one about Peter Gibbs, uh, the Isle of Mull air mystery, and Viking gods. Were they really aliens? It was indeed a very interesting episode to make, as they all are, but finding out about this really weird mystery that happened in Mull, I've been to Mull, and like with so many of these subjects, never knew that it happened. It's all been kept under the radar, so to speak. How are things in your part of the world? Please do let me know right into UFOs and other paranormal stuff at gmail.com. It would be nice to hear from a few more of you. Uh, The weather here is really strange. It's February, so it's meant to be cold, but it's quite warm. I mean, it's showing 9 degrees now, but it is in the morning time. It'll be about 13, 15 degrees later on, centigrade. And that is is a bit weird. But whatever the weather, everything can be made a little bit more better by visiting our partners at greatdanes.uk. They can make everything better, trust me, those Danish. They can make everything better. For those that don't know, or you may already know already, just to let you know that this podcast is now available on Amazon Music and Audible as well, as well as a host of other uh, podcast providers. UFOs and other paranormal stuff is also available on Spotify and will not be leaving Spotify unless they don't want me on there anymore. But I will not be giving out any advice about anything to do with COVID-19 or any other health matters too. So, there. The podcast is also available on Apple Podcasts as well as wherever you or your friends or family get their podcasts from. It's also available on YouTube as well. Also, if you like what I do here with UFOs and other paranormal stuff, please do consider making a little donation, just a tiny one. Uh, Just go to the ko-fi.com forward slash UFOs and OPS. That's K-O hyphen F-I dot com forward slash ufos and ops or one word just a quick one if anyone would like to sponsor ufos and other paranormal stuff podcast please send me an email to ufos and ops at gmail.com that's ufos and ops at gmail.com i look forward to hearing from everybody anyway that's enough of all that on with today's show the Todmorden UFO Incidents. Todmorden, for those that may not know it, is a small market town in the north of England, situated 17 miles north of Manchester in the Upper Calder Valley in Calderdale, West Yorkshire. And in 1980, it found itself at the centre of a strange murder inquiry. But a murder wasn't the only strange thing that happened that year in that town, and 1980 may not in fact have been the start of Todmorden's strange occurrences. Todmorden is a beautiful old town. Its town hall and market hall are testament to that. It was a hive of activity back in the days of the Industrial Revolution and the remnants from that all-important part of the town's history can be seen in its old mills that still stand to this day. But this small town north of the great northern city of Manchester has a bit of a penchant for weirdness too. A frenzy of cattle mutilations occurred there, some as recently as July 2020. Topmaden's people apparently see UFOs on a regular basis of at least once every two years. But today's episode focuses on the more well-known events that happened in that town back in 1980. A headline in the Sunday Mirror newspaper dated September 27, 1981, read UFO Death Riddle. The article went on, A man's mysterious death is the centre of the biggest UFO riddle in years. Of course, news of the infamous Rendlesham Forest UFO incident from the end of 1980 had not yet found its way into the media yet. The newspaper article was talking about the riddle that surrounded the death of a man called Zygmunt Adamski. On the 6th of June 1980, Mr Adamski had gone out to buy some groceries, but went missing 
and was never seen alive again. Five days later, on the 11th of June, Todmorden Police Force received a telephone call from a worker at J.W. Parker's coal yard in Todmorden after one of the workers, Trevor Parker, had discovered a body. The police arrived at the coal yard to find that the body was on the top of a coal pile in the yard. The officers, PC Alan Godfrey and a colleague, wondered how this body could have gotten up the coal heap at all, let alone why it was up there in the first place. It took the other police officer some time to get up the coal pile and to look at the body. He had to use a nearby rail to help him up. It had been raining and it was very slippery in that place. Climbing up a coal pile was not easy at all and every step up was very difficult and very slow. What the other officer saw at the top of the coal heap shocked him. He found it difficult to find the words to convey to Godfrey what he was looking at exactly. So Godfrey made his own way up to the top of the coal heap to see for himself. It was indeed a body of a deceased man. His clothes had absolutely no coal on them at all. No coal dust, no coal dirt, or anything to do with coal on his body or clothes at all. The police officers were almost covered in coal dust, and that was, like I said, after it had been raining. You would have thought with so much rain, it would have kept the coal dust down, instead of covering the officers. The man was wearing a suit, but without a shirt. His clothes did not fit him properly. His wallet was missing too. But the look on the man's face is what Alan Godfrey will never forget about that discovery. His eyes were wide open and his face looked to be that of a man in pure fear. Godfrey thinks that the last thing this man had seen had completely terrified him. His hair had been cut in a very weird way, short enough though that the police could see burn marks around the man's neck. Small burn marks, no bigger than a 1p coin, but arranged in a circle formation around the crown of the man's head. Very bizarre. Alan notices an open wound on the man's neck. Closer inspection reveals what appears to be some green gel substance. This gel substance was found to be... Well, it turns out nobody knew what it was. No one could identify it. PC Godfrey is sure that the man did not die of natural causes. But the autopsy tells a different story. The medical examiner concluded that the victim had been dead for only 8 to 10 hours. Trevor Parker, the worker that discovered the body at the coal yard, can attest to that as he is positive that the body was not in the yard when he performed his morning rounds. No indication of serious injury was found. The coroner, however, finds evidence of a heart attack. That, and the terrified expression on the man's face, leads the medical examiner to conclude that the victim died of fright. The examiner does not recognise the goo that Godfrey found on the man's neck. He has never seen anything like it before. With that in mind, he sent a sample off to the laboratory and the results come back inconclusive. Seriously, no one can identify it. The police still have to identify the dead man. That is where things start to get a little more stranger. Godfrey finds a missing person report that matches the body. He appears to be a coal miner called Zygmunt Adamski, Ziggy for short. Yes, he was a coal miner, and yes, he was found dead at a coal yard. Workplace accident, maybe? No. This coal yard was over 22 miles from the one that Adamski worked at. The workers at the coal yard he was found in are unable to identify him. No one knows him there. It is not even known if Adamski had ever set foot in Todmorden before being found dead there, as he was a resident of Tingley, near Wakefield, nearly 25 miles east of Todmorden.
Sigmund Adamski went missing on the 6th of June and was found dead on the coal heap five days later on the 11th of June after only being dead for, at most, 10 hours. Yet his face only showed one day of stubble on it. Was he shaving for the five days that he was missing? That's a little strange, isn't it? Go missing out of character and shave or be shaved on the top of the head too, then die on top of coal heap? His wife was chronically ill, and so he couldn't just have got up and left. According to his friends and family, he was not the type of person to ever just get up and leave. Not the type of person to just get up and go anywhere. Also, his goddaughter's wedding was meant to have taken place on one of the days that Adamski was missing. He was even meant to have walked her down the aisle. Witnesses say that this man loved all of his family very, very much and that it was completely at odds with the man that they knew him to be just to get up and leave, no notice or anything. There seems to be no evidence at all of foul play. Adamski, according to witness reports, had no enemies or people that may want him dead and so the chief of police in Todmorden says case closed. He died of natural causes. But to Alan Godfrey, the 33-year-old police constable, this did not sit right at all. His gut feeling was telling him that there was more to the case of Zygmunt Adamski. That comes five months later. PC Alan Godfrey may just be about to find out that Zygmunt Adamski's death was not natural and that his killers were not of this earth. GreatDanes.uk is a unique gift shop that specialises in Danish designed items. We also carry many other Scandinavian products. Cozy, comfortable footwear, George Jensen designed jewellery, Eva Solo designed homeware, candles, cups, mugs, clocks, scarves, lights, gadgets, pets, accessories, bags, bimble and bumble toys, eyewear, Christmas decorations, everything you could ever want, and with an unmatched, beautiful Danish design to it too. Don't forget the food and drink, salty chocolate licorice, the vintage food grocery box, remoulade, glug mix, and more too. Then why not wash that all down with a nice Alborg Jubileum Aquavit, Gammeldansk Dram, Blomberg Mulled Wine, Tuborg Classic and Tuborg Gold Beer, Carlsberg Black Gold Beer and Soft Drink for the Kids. For worldwide deliveries, visit the website greatdanes.uk. That's G-R-8-D-A-N-E-S dot U-K. And get your order in today. There's also Lego, of course. Always drink responsibly for T's and C's. Please visit the website. That's greatdanes.uk. Now, as I said earlier, this is not the first strange occurrence to happen to a person in Todmorden. A podcast called Uncanny by Danny Robbins states that they have found information with a bit of an eerie coincidence. In 1880, exactly 100 years before the Adamski incident, another man had disappeared from Todmorden. This man was 69-year-old William Weedle. His body was finally found one month later in the Irish Sea. It looked like he had just been dropped there. Added to that, I think that this case bears a startling resemblance to that which befell Peter Gibbs on the Isle of Mull only five years before. Gibbs had taken a light aircraft up from the Glenforsa Hotel's airfield on the night of the 24th of December 1975 and disappeared, never to be seen alive again. As we know, his body was found on an area of land that had been searched already, similar to Adamski, whose body was found by Trevor Parker, who had already done his morning rounds and not seen the body. Gibbs was found part way up a hill, while Adamski's body was found on top of a hill made of coal, and both showed no injury and no evidence to how they got there. 29th of November, 1980. 
Todmorden Police Station. PC Alan Godfrey is working a night shift at the police station when he receives a telephone call stating that there is a herd of cows walking through a residential area. Now, for police in Todmorden and other rural areas in those days, this was a common occurrence. People had been out drinking until all hours of the morning and would call up the police to tell them some lie, like cows were out wandering around the streets, just to be mischievous. And so thinking that this is just pranksters or drunks, Godfrey thinks it may be nothing. But he he drives out anyway to investigate, thinking that it would break up the monotony of a boring night. He sees nothing, and so returns to the police station. But then, another call comes in, this time from a completely different person. Godfrey thinks this is just a big prank. But then another call comes in, this time from an elderly woman stating that there are cows walking around in her front garden. Godfrey decides to get back in his car and drive out to investigate. Maybe he will have to wrangle some cows together and get them into a field after all. No cows. But the elderly lady is a sweet little old lady, completely the opposite to the type of person that would commit a hoax. She insists that she saw cows walking around outside and inside her front garden. This is where things start to turn very weird. The lady looks at Alan and says that she definitely did see the cows. But then after she called the police station to let them know, she saw them all disappear in a brilliant flash of bright white light. Alan thinks that this is very strange and that maybe the lady had seen something else. But something was bothering him about all of this. Godfrey got back into the police car and left the police station once again at around 5am to complete the last round of his shift. He drives through the town centre and out to the Yorkshire moorland. It is then that PC Alan Godfrey sees something, something that he has never seen before. He said it was hovering about five foot off the ground. He knew this because as his car was approaching the object, he was able to see underneath it. It appeared to be diamond in shape, 20 foot wide and 14 foot high, and appeared to be solid but with black panelling or or black windows on the object's top. Godfrey got out of his car, looked at the object spinning in the air. He notes that it was spinning anti-clockwise, but that the leaves and the twigs were swirling clockwise. Godfrey tried to use his handheld police-issued radio and then his police car radio, but both would not yield a response from any officer. He could not contact anyone, and so decided to draw a quick sketch of the UFO. All of a sudden there was a big whoosh sound and everything went white, bright white. Godfrey states that in only a split second... The white light had gone, the UFO had gone, but he was not where he had been. He was further up the road and driving in the police car. He stated in an article in the Mirror newspaper that a bus travelling on the road stopped and the driver got out and noticed the same thing, but that bus driver's identity has never ever been disclosed. Godfrey drove back to where the UFO had been and noticed that there was a bit of debris on the road. Also, that the road surface was black and dry too, but that the rest of the road surface was wet because it had been raining. Doing what any good police officer would do in that instant, Godfrey decides to investigate further. He walks a short distance to a nearby park which has a rugby pitch in it, and there, right in front of him, is the herd of cows. But how did they get there? A gate keeps animals out of the park. Yet this gate was closed. Can cows open gates now and close them behind them? I doubt it. 
Also remember, Godfrey somehow went from sketching the UFO to being a short distance away from where it had been and driving away from it in the blink of an eye. Godfrey had left the police station at 5am. The drive to where the UFO was took just under 10 minutes. He was looking at and sketching the UFO for around 3 minutes, yet he states that when he got back to the place where the UFO was, it was 6am. PC Alan Godfrey had somehow lost around 45 minutes of time. He also had a split boot, which he could not account for. He put in his report to his superiors and thought no more about the incident. However, one of his colleagues at the station leaked it to the local newspaper. With the Godfrey incident now open to a wider audience, many people took interest in the Todmorden UFO incident. A lot of people thought that as a policeman was involved in it, it might somehow bring a bit more truth or integrity to their own real UFO events. A short time later, Godfrey received a letter from Russia, from Moscow. Professor Valery Sakharov wanted Godfrey to write to him about his incident in Todmorden, as well as any information Godfrey might get on an, at that time, a lesser known incident that had just happened in Suffolk, in the place we all know called Rendlesham Forest. The now infamous Rendlesham Forest UFO incident occurred only four weeks after that of PC Alan Godfrey's incident in Todmorden. Being that this was 1980 and Britain and the USA were still engaged against the USSR in the Cold War, Godfrey decided to do what he thought was the right thing to do and hand Sakharov's letter in to his superiors. Shortly after he did that, he received a visit from a man who said that he was from the ministry. Godfrey reckons that this man thought of himself as a, a bit of a James Bond just call me the man from the ministry, he said, when Godfrey was being interviewed. The man from the ministry was sat in the corner of the room, not actually taking the interview. But, Godfrey did notice that this man had a file on him, an inch thick. And he could see the sketch of the UFO that he had drawn on that infamous night, in the file. What was more was that this man from the ministry had with him a sudden death report. Godfrey recognised that straight away because it was the file that belonged to Zygmunt Adamski's case. Godfrey's UFO incident and Zygmunt Adamski's case had been put together in this file that the man from the ministry had with him. Why? I don't know, said Godfrey. Because the Russians were involved, I was asked to keep in contact with this professor and pass on any letters I'd get to my superiors who would pass it on to the man from the ministry. Speaking to UFO Chronicles, Godfrey said the powers that be decided to discredit me. It started very small and built into a crescendo that went from the sublime to the ridiculous and I've never understood why they did it. Sadly, with all that discrediting going on, Alan Godfrey lost his job in the police force, a job that he loved doing so much. But even though his life went through quite a tumultuous time in the years after that event, he never forgot it, and he never changed his story. He also never changed his sense of humour either. He was once asked by comedian, radio presenter and TV presenter as well as avid football fan Frank Skinner, if the UFO had a GB sticker on it. Godfrey replied by saying, No, Frank, it had a WBA sticker on it. It belonged to West Bromwich Albion. West Bromwich Albion is Frank Skinner's team. Ladies and gentlemen, if you want to read more about the events in Todmorden that night, they have been turned into a book written by Alan Godfrey. And the book is called Who or What Were They? and is available now on many online bookshops. I think it also includes a little bit to to the um, Zygmunt Adamski case as well. There are also rumours doing the rounds that the Alan Godfrey Zygmunt Adamski UFO incidents are to be made into a film. 
I look forward to the release of that and any news on that and I will bring you as soon as I have it. If you hear about it before I do, please do send me an email to let me know and I will do my best to let everybody else know. Of course, that email address, ladies and gentlemen, is UFOs and other paranormal stuff at gmail.com. UFOs and other paranormal stuff at gmail.com. Don't forget, ladies and gentlemen, have a look at the Facebook page and have a look at the Twitter site as well, all UFOs and OPS. Also, if you like what I do here with UFOs and other paranormal stuff, please do consider making a little donation, just a tiny one. Uh, just go to the ko-fi.com forward slash UFOs and OPS. That's ko com forward slash UFOs and OPS, all one word. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, I'd really like to thank you for listening to my podcast. I really do appreciate it. Until the next episode, though, this is a goodbye from me. Stay safe. Please do stay in contact too. And I will speak to you again in a couple of weeks. GreatDanes.uk is a unique gift shop that specialises in Danish designed items. We also carry many other Scandinavian products. Cozy comfortable footwear, George Jensen designed jewellery, Eva Solo designed homeware, candles, cups, mugs, clocks, scarves, lights, gadgets, pets accessories, bags, bimble and bumble toys, eyewear, Christmas decorations, everything you could ever want and with an unmatched beautiful Danish design to it too. Don't forget the food and drink, salty chocolate licorice, the vintage food grocery box, remoulade, glug mix and more too. Then why not wash that all down with a nice Alborg Jubileum Aquavit, Gammeldansk Dram, Blomberg Mulled Wine, Tuborg Classic and Tuborg Gold Beer, Carlsberg Black Gold beer and soft drink for the kids. For worldwide deliveries, visit the website greatdanes.uk. That's G-R-8-D-A-N-E-S dot U-K. And get your order in today. There's also Lego, of course. Always drink responsibly for T's and C's. Please visit the website. That's greatdanes.uk.